talk. Um, this is what's happened. My experience is over well, since the 1960s, really, and my father before me. Um, this presentation is a history, really, of how bees and beekeeping changed in Cardiganshire since about 1960, I suppose. Uh, not only has beekeeping in Wales changed over the past 50 years, but so has farming. Wales is predominantly a sort of sheep and dairy area. It's wet, a good forage, good grass growing area. Uh, some of this presentation, by the way, it contains material that from a previous talk, right? But most of the presentation is new, so do bear with me. If you think I'm repeating myself, don't, uh, don't switch off, uh, not straight away anyway. In the 1960s, in the 1960s, a uh, farm typically around this area, quite a uh, good farm would be sort of 20 milking cows, would be a few pigs and sheep and one thing and another. And the cows would be grazing outdoors in the summer and they'd probably be fed meadow hay in the winter. That was typical. Today, the same sort of farm today would be sort of 200 to 800 cows, specially bred for milk production. They'd be kept permanently indoors. Uh, they probably wouldn't survive outdoors and they fed on modified rye grasses which are in turn fed by your artificial chemical nitrogen fertilizers and mechanically harvested four or five times a year. Of course, this is extreme and unsuitable intensification of agriculture and it, is, it has made much of the previously rich bee foraging meadow pasture uh, of, of the area that has been in the area for centuries. It's made it a, really a floral desert because it's depleted soils and wildlife. Uh, wild white clover, which is one of the main honey crops in this area, has all but virtually disappeared. And this sort of presentation tells, well, it's a story of how the local indigenous bees have been adversely affected in terms of performance and tempo by large scale imports from the 1960s onwards. Uh, these bees have been imported for profit by commercial dealers and so on. And they've also been sold to well-intentioned amateurs uh, ever since the 1970s onwards. And how local beekeepers have successfully or more or less successfully overcome these difficulties and how we still uh, manage to, to keep the bees and, and, and get some sort of honey crop off of them. Um, now, many of these problems, they're not unique to this area. They're shared by many other dairy farming areas really throughout the world. I mean, there are third generation professional beekeepers that I know I'm sort of friendly with in Normandy, in Northern France, and they face exactly the same problems, both in terms of bee imports into their areas and the farming practices. And um, talking in a honey show to Mike Palmer a few years ago, and he's in a, a dairy area in, in, in Northeastern the United States, and he's got pretty much the same sort of problems. So anyway, so that's my background is I've kept bees since I was a teenager. Um, I've worked worldwide. My, my profession is, was an engineer, so I haven't been able to look after bees on a, on a weekly or even a fortnightly basis for lots of time. But nevertheless, the bees have sort of looked after themselves, or well, the indigenous bees in the area were able to look after themselves in minimal sort of management. Um, now we're at about, you know, 50 colonies or so. And I've got a few permanent sites. I got two temporary apiaries. I've got a mating apiary, uh, which is pretty isolated, about quite high up in the mountains. Um, and I normally keep about eight colonies on average per apiary because, as I say, the flora has disappeared from what it used to be 50 years ago and you can, can only keep fewer colonies before they, they, they run out of forage. Uh, so that's, um, that's where we are. So that's, that's the history of Cardiganshire then very briefly. It, it's, as I said, it's a wet, green, grassy, sheep and dairy agricultural area. It is marginal for bees because we get wet summers. So the bees need to be tough and they need to be fairly frugal in order so, to survive here. So pre-1960s, pre pre-1960s, the bees, they were remarkably gentle and they were tough and they were frugal uh, and many operations such as sort of hiving swarms or putting supers on or having a quick look under the crown board, they could be carried out without a veil or smoker. Um, foreign bees started arriving in the early 1960s uh, with commercial pe people that moved into the area. 
Um, so the, the early bees, as I said, pre-1960s, there was uh, low swarming, dark and docile. And during the early 1960s, several large commercial operations moved into the area and they brought with them their own bees. They weren't all foreign bees, but they were some British bees and there were some mongrel bees and some of the sort of buckfasty type bees. Uh, these commercial bee farmers had up to 400 colonies and they was, tended to be softer bees. Um, I know that later on, after he moved into the area, one of them with 400 and odd stocks hired a manager and that manager replaced all the queens with, I think it was Carnolian queens, or certainly exotic queens. Uh, and the following winter, three quarters of that stock died. So it, it, it's, it's a tough area. It's a tough area. So this area is marginal at best, and, and these operations pretty much were, were a failure. Um, now, exotic bees under ideal conditions, they might produce more surplus, but we only get sort of ideal conditions here about once every seven years or so. So averaged over a 10 year period, the local bees, they're more productive and more profitable, certainly. Um, as a, as a there we are, one employee, the manager who requeened 400 colonies, 310 of which died according to the, some of the stuff that we're doing. So during, uh, of course, once these bees started mixing with the local bees, F2 aggression became a problem uh, resulting from these inputs. And uh, we all had to acquire different bee management techniques and get bigger American style smokers and become clever at using them as well. Otherwise, you needed to be very tough, I think. Um, so the bees in pre-1960s, they were dark, docile, they're productive bees, easy to manage. Um, rural people kept usually a couple of hives. Uh, the rural people, the rural people tended to work, the farms were more labor intensive. Um, you didn't have so much big tractors and big machineries. People had a little gray fergie or something. Uh, the rural people then worked the land and uh, had sidelines. They, they tended to live in cottages and keep a few chickens and a pig, and a pig for, the, for the winter. And those sort of people tended to have a couple of bees up the top of the garden. Now, they didn't need to a lot of attention, these bees. The bees give some surplus every year. They swarmed infrequently. And, and if the, the householder caught the swarmer and, and put it in a box, quite often the housewife would do that. Uh, and these bees didn't bother people too much by stinging. I mean, the wives could walk up and down the garden, hang out the washing without really being stung or being bothered. So, as I say, it didn't take much skill to be successful with these bees. Unfortunately, once these inputs arrived, um, once these inputs arrived, then that was a different story. And, uh, you know, the, the bees became mongrelized, beekeeping became much more demanding in terms of skill and in terms of, of stings. Um, so, as I say, these bees give sur some surplus every year, and average over a 10-year period, they were more profitable than the exotic bees. Low swarming average, swarming once every sort of three years or so in, in nature. The old queens quite often were naturally superseded, and a lot of these people didn't know, uh, didn't ever go in the brood box. So, as I said, the bees were frugal, over winter did not starve in the summer. Needed little or no autumn or spring feeding. I mean, this this business we get these days of uh, warnings from the NBU to uh, if we got a fortnight of rain in June or July, you get a warning. Normally, you get a warning from the NBU to make sure your bees are not starving. Well, of course, that, that never never occurred to us, never occurred around here, and it still doesn't. So the local bees, then, as I said, they were the pre sixties bees, the most efficient bees in terms of honey produced per man hour of labour, and or input of sugar fed. Because bear in mind, a lot of these bees had survived the second war, as I said, and when sugar was rationed, and, and they would never never saw any sugar. So, so there there you have it. Right, there's a couple of myths that I think I talked a lot about bees. You see it in magazines. You see it, and you certainly see it on some of these websites. There are opinions and beliefs amongst beekeepers worse than any other hobby or, or, or activity, I think. The opinions and beliefs that cause swallowing of false teeth and punch up in car parks at BKA meetings. So before we go any further, let's clarify one or two of these in. 
that um, that correct some of these. So one is the belief that fierce bees produce more honey. Now that's, that's quite commonly stated. Well, they might in certain circumstances. If you've got an enthusiastic amateur beekeeper who's just got two hives and one is very docile, he's more likely to have a poke about inside there and so on, keep on disturbing and distressing the bees. The aggressive bees, on the other hand, are more likely to defend their hives, so they'll be left alone and they won't have nosy people poking about inside them, stressing them out. So bees that meet your apiary gate are also more likely to jump on a wasp. They're less likely to be robbed. Um, so the second myth, which is the biggest one, is an almost fanatical belief that buckfast bees are so some sort of separate magic subspecies and that they were invented a hundred years ago at Buckfast Abbey by Brother Adam. Now, this is clearly wrong. Nevertheless, this myth is promoted widely by both our learned friends at the NBU in New York and the British uh, Keepers Associations around the country, as well as those snake oil salesmen with commercial interest in doing so. The so-called buckfast are mostly Italian linguistica subspecies crossed with one or more honeybee subspecies, including originally the AAMM, the, the British dark bee. So that was the first cross that Brother Adam did. He crossed the Italians with the indigenous dark bee and he found he got a lot of hybrid vigor. Um, but of course that doesn't last. It only lasts for one generation and then you get F2 crosses and you get all sorts of nastiness and monkeyization. So, he continued to cross Italians, Brother Adam, he, he very skilled beekeeper, no doubt about it. He continued to cross Italians with other pure races until he ran out of pure races. And he did this for over 70 years. But all his attempts in all that time to fix characteristics in later generations, they failed. And it is only in recent times that we know why. Now, Dr. John Chambers gave an ex excellent scientific explanation of the basic DNA analysis of the various honeybee genetics at the National Honey Show. I think it was last year, maybe or the year before. And this work is the result of some serious research and not something that sort of Brian down at local BKA has read some in a magazine somewhere or seen on some website, or that Fred in the next county sells genuine pedigree buckfast queens that is bred himself and artificially inseminated in his shed or something. John Chambers' presentation is a must watch really for all serious beekeepers. Now that's the YouTube, YouTube link to go and watch it. It's about an hour, just over an hour long and you need to sit and watch it. Well, I've watched it several times and still learn from it. But um, if you want to find it or if you're interested in finding it, it is on the um, Honey Show website. And I think it's on last year's videos. The videos are all on there. Uh, and also, it's not just John Chambers research, there has also been clearly, rigorously and scientifically proven research that's been published by worldwide universities as far as field as Japan and the USA. So if you don't believe me or you don't believe John Chambers, follow that link, uh, that uh, Tand Online um, report there. It, it's, it's a big, big, it's like a telephone book. It's a big research, but the research program comes to the conclusion that all the buckfast bees that are sold uh, today uh, go back uh, and that buckfast bees from 1917 onwards are based on linguistic genetics. So they're mostly Italian bees. They're most, so they're mostly, they got the Italian characteristics. Right, so that's that one out of the way. So the next slide, the bees then in this area, then after they've been mongrelized, what happened then? Well, the imported exotic bees were of various hues and appearance, but they were, as I say, and still are mainly Italian genetically. Uh, so when they came to this area, because it's so marginal here, they imported mainly Italian or Buckfast type bees, they were a disaster. Not only did they ruin the indigenous stock by making them cross, but they also bankrupted their owners in many cases. They have to be fed summer and winter during a wet cardigan in summer. Now, you've got to remember that the ideal conditions that suit these exotic bees only occur maybe once every seven years, or maybe even even more rare than that uh, in this area. So what happens is on the seventh year when it's brilliant, like last year, 2019 was very good. 2019, those bees would have done very well here in 2019 in Cardiganshire. 
They might not have done so well elsewhere in Wales, but they would have done well in Cardiganshire. But for the 10 years before, they, they, they did they only did tons of sugar, you know, month in, month out. So as I say, these, these imported bees, they were a disaster. They ruined the indigenous stock and they bankrupted their owners and they needed uh, feeding. And once the formerly docile local dark bee got crossed with these imports, they became extremely aggressive. In the early crosses, right, they were, they, 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 the F2 aggression was extreme. Um, but as I say, the Italian based bees are too soft and totally unsuited. And after a couple of generations, the viciousness of these resulting mongrels were, was extreme. Um, of course, what happens is you get these crosses uh, because of imports and the bees become aggressive. And of course, it's the dark bees that gets the blame. And it still does to this day. And of course, the, the popular solution to this is to import more yellow bees because they do so. So, uh, and then you, you, it's an ever decreasing circle. So the viciousness, as I say, on the 1960s uh, was on a scale that would make some of these African bees that you see videos of, they'd, they'd be sissies. Now, the, the perceived wisdom is if you've got vicious colonies, is to kill the queen and replace the queen. Now, my father before me, and I, I think he was right, during the late 1960s, when F2 aggression was at its worst in this area, my father found an apiary in the middle of nowhere, in the garden of an abandoned farmhouse, the land of which had been swallowed up by a bigger farm next door. This was quite common in those days, and it's, it's gone on. Um, and this was before the days when such places were sold off to the rich at inflated prices as small holdings with a small paddock for the pony. That became a, so that apiary that he found became a quarantine apiary for his most aggressive stocks. And his reasoning was that if everything else is good about the colony, that they don't swarm, that they're productive, and they're superseding type bees, uh, but they've become aggressive because they've crossed he said he, he didn't want to get rid of the good genes. He didn't want to, right? So he, he quarantined, had a quarantine apiary where he put all these, about 10 of them, colonies of bees that were, that were everything good about them, apart from the fact that they're quite vicious because of the crossing. Now harvesting honey from that, from there, was where I learned the importance of having a good smoker and knowing how to use it. So the perceived wisdom would have been to requeen that lot which we should have lost some excellent genetic traits in terms of productivity and non-swarming, etc. And over time, many of those colonies superseded and became darker again and calmer. And I've still got some of their descendants. And I'm, I'm, glad, that, I'm glad that my father did that. I, I've, um, that was a good move uh, over time. So these, as I say, these bees, bees are vicious. They bombard, they follow you for hundreds of yards, they chase you indoors. And they'd bombard the window, they'd bombard the kitchen window trying to follow you. I can remember having to put the dog in a cold bath because his fur was full of these stinging bees. And just his nose poking out, he'd drown the bees, get the bees off of him. So that was just one of those things. So where are we here? Yeah, we are. My father quarantined some of these bad tempered stocks with otherwise good characteristics in order to preserve their DNA. And that was, that was a wise move at the time. And we managed, techniques were developed to manage the worst of these colonies. Um, even in the days before sheriffs still permitted adversarial beekeeping, where you would, you know, you, you could protect yourself. Um, okay, so I became darker. So I still have some of the descendants. And these unsuitable imports are still going on, unfortunately, with gullible beekeepers being taken in by the sales type of queen importers. Now, now the main flow in this area is from the middle of June to the end of July. There's no spring oil seed rape in this area, just to give you an idea how marginal it is. And there's very little August heather in here anymore because the mountain, the cultivation of the mountain has changed as well, farming has changed up there. So, and as is, as I say, as is often the case, there is no settled warm period there during the main flow, which is which is sort of middle of June to the end of July. Uh, so 2020 was a very poor year. 
Um, there was a good flow in 2019, and 2018 was not too bad. But July 2020 was cold and damp throughout, and only the tough local bees had any surplus. Now, there are several beekeepers winning quite a big way in within the, the three counties around here. Um, and we keep these some of these exotic bees and buy queens in, and I know that some of them are already advertising to buy local and need to keep their customers going. So, there we are. Six, seven, uh, so, okay, so, sting avoidance. So, pre PJ Sheriff suit, as I say, the fencing veil, that was a big step forward. Uh, 1966 or 1968, or something, the, the protection consisted of a straw hat and veil. Uh, so, you had to be skilled not to get stung too badly. Uh, and this straw hat and veil was plenty good enough for handling a local bee. An occasional sting sharpened the bee skills in reading the bees, reading the bees and using the smoker. That's, a, that's another skill that's not taught these days. So beekeepers had to learn better tricks for hive inspections. One such trick was uh, these vicious colonies in the quarantine. Quarantine was to smoke them um, and put, uh, remove the supers and leave the supers on the stand and take the brood chamber away to the far end of the apiary somewhere take away some distance, leaving only supers on a stand. Right, so that meant then that the aggressive defensive bees would all fly back and sit on a super while you could get on with a brood box and, and, and go through it or catch queen or whatever you wanted to do. So the, as I say, we all acquired bigger smokers and we all bought sheriff veils as soon as this, the fencing veils as soon as they became available. Uh, and did, well, when I was taught beekeeping, the local, local BK at Lampeter, they taught beginners, uh, and there was a lot of people, a lot of people there with lot, long years of experience. Um, probably of the age then that I am now, but uh, they taught beginners, there's no such thing as bad tempered bees, only clumsy beekeepers. That's what they would tell me every time I was getting stung. So, And there is no doubt that there, is, there are many sort of intangible skills that a beekeeper picks up over the years at, about hunting bees that he cannot be learned from books. Again, I remember as an aside here that during my teenage years, we had a foul brood officer, a guy called Tom Collins. He would visit us and he had a Morris Thousand van. I think before that he had a Ford popular type van with a pointed nose and his sheepdog Sully, he used to come around. Now he wore a brown dust coat like Arkwright from Ronnie Barker in Open All Hours. And he had a veil, something like Queen Victoria got married in. And he was a strong, small, straight, old-fashioned smoker, but he was very skillful in the use of it. And he was probably the most skilled beekeeper I've ever seen. I've ever the privilege to watch in operation. I don't ever remember him having to close the hive down before he finished what he intended to do due to loss of control. I don't even remember him losing control. We even with the most aggressive bees of the mid 1960s. So uh, I don't know what he, people like him of his generation will make today's brigade with their full suits and Wellingtons and those silly blue gloves. And the first thing many of them do is to tread on the stand or the hive stand, shake all the hive and then bang a smoker against the front of the hive. You know, they've, they've revved the bees up before they even start. And they don't notice they're doing it quite often because it's so well protected. But as I say, to go back to late 1960s, we were all clumsy beekeepers because the bees were, were quite, quite aggressive in some cases. Uh, it's, but even, as I say, even the worst bees can be handled without too many stings with the right approach. Right, that was um, typically how the Welsh dark bees were handled before imports. And some of my best dark bees today are still this docile. And I much prefer working dressed like this. When you're working all day on the bees, it's hot, heavy work. And the last thing you want is to be sweating in a suit in Wellington boots and gloves and clouds of smoke. Um, right, and that's my father there about to tackle a quite aggressive uh, hive. And he's got his, his sheriff smock. He never owned a pair of gloves and he got some ankle protection there because he didn't own any Wellingtons. Um, you know, so by the late 70s, my father had acquired a sheriff top too, but that's as far as he went. He never owned a pair of gloves, Wellingtons or a bee suit, and yet he received few stings, even from quite sort of uh, pissy bees. Uh, this is him about dismantling a bad-tempered colony. 
with the ankle protection there, look. So the cardigan should moving on, man. Eh? Cardigan should be today. What have we got today? What have we managed to save? So local beekeepers struggle and persevered with these mongrels throughout the 60s and 70s. My father got involved with them. Um, my father got involved with the Village Bee Breeders Association, as it was in the 60s originally, with a man called Beals Cooper. Beals Cooper came down, he was, he, he was visited my father and he did some bits and pieces together. And my father also, well, the Village Bee Breeders became Bibba. And my father did much work with Beals Cooper and Albert Knight and others. Uh, there was a local Bibba breeding group formed uh, in the 1970s. Uh, so much of the local genetics, so the bee genetics in this area were preserved during the 60s and 70s. Um, and managed to breed out the desirable traits from these mongrels, and they became darker and more, you know, more back to what they were again in, in, in a, towards the 1980s. So, but we had further large imports, foreign bees, more commercial interest came into the area during the 80s and 90s, and I know one with uh, one of them told me that we just imported 300 New Zealand queens. Well, of course, that's, uh, you know, and, and that guy, as far as I'm aware, he ended up buying sugar to feed the bees and buying honey to sell in the shop. So, you know, and then Varroa came at the same time and that changed beekeeping forever. Um, so, so uh, successful beekeeping and today is more complicated. So successful beekeeping today, you can no longer stick a supers on in, in, in April and take them off in August and, and pretty much ignore the bees and hope they'll do well, but they won't. So successful beekeeping today involves keeping a mercenary eye on Varroa, right? you could do Varroa counts, as well as raising batches of queens from the best 10% of your stocks. You got to replace the rubbish. Unfortunately, the average beekeeper thinks this is beyond him, uh, or is not confident enough to raise his own queens, and him or her then they often end up importing stocks and neglecting for a while, storing up problems for the rest of us. So, as, as I say, the, the New Zealand queens, they were a disaster, and this was not simply a re repeat of the 1960s, it was worse, because we had a war to contend with as well by the early 1990s. Um, so, but by the early 2000s, my bees were still fairly pure AMM and Varroa was manageable within minimum treatments. Right? Monitor it, is, you've got to keep a mercenary eye on it, monitor it and minimum treatments. But that all suddenly changed in 2015 and I found out why Varroa came back with a vengeance. And what it was, somebody had moved in less than a mile away with, with some exotic bees and there was an upsurge of Varroa and a lot of my nukes that year, they turned yellow. Um, and of course, the following spring, uh, the, the colonies that they moved in were all dead, but by then the damage was done. So, so anyway, so there we are. So, uh, Varroa in, in people, as leave alone beekeepers, Varroa does tend to take off. Because for example, earlier this year, I found an abandonment swarm coming to my supers. And it was absolutely choked with Varroa. I did a, a, a Varroa alcohol wash on them, and there were dozens, dozens, 200 bees, there were dozens of Varroa. And that was on a swarm. Because um, as I say, five years ago, somebody moved into an area less than a mile from me with six colonies of these yellow bees, and they ruined my mating for that year. But they all died the following winter, but by then the damage was done. So what I do now, I have a remote mating apiary, is a thousand foot up, and this is quite successful. The yellow drones don't like it up there. It's too, it's too harsh for them. So, um, as I say, as I said earlier, my, my father worked with Albert Knight um, and Beowulf Cooper, and a culmination of, of, of what they did together was my father wrote that booklet in 1984. It's out of print now, uh, but if you can find a copy, uh, much of the information in there is, is just as applicable today as it was back in 1984. There's been a few uh, developments in terms of uh, raising queens in now easier because we've got artificial um, queen cell cups and things, but uh, the information in there is sound. So, 
there we are. That was my father. Typically, how he would work his bees, he can spend all day on the bees, dressed like that, and it's not too hot. It's no Wellingtons, not a great, no gloves. You're not clumsy. You can pick up queens, um, and uh, and all those colonies, you know, they're strong. That's that's his queen raising apiary, or it was his queen raising apiary. That's Beals Cooper working with my father. Beals Cooper visited the area quite a bit in the mid in the mid seventies, and he's there with my father. He also where I've got the mating apiary up in the other side of the mountains at the minute. He he, he also visited up there as well. There was a experienced beekeeper and the good bees up there. So, so there we have it. So there's, that's a book. That's Beals Cooper's book, which is out of print, unfortunately, but it's available in soft copy on the Biba website for download. But every bee beekeeper, every serious beekeeper should have this book on the shelf. I refer to it regularly. It contains information and wisdom is not found elsewhere. Right, and so successfully keep bees in um, today. Right, they must produce enough to keep themselves and go some way towards keeping their owner. Um, the success criterion must be the weight of honey produced per man hour of labor input, as, as Beals Cooper's saying. As you don't often see it outside of Beals Cooper's uh, uh, writings. But uh, it's it's as a sound principle. Bee farmers often complain that they would earn more money per hour stacking shells in Tesco than they do producing honey, and yet they focus almost totally on the amount of honey per hive roof, rather than the amount produced per man hour of labour input for the money that they spend on sugar feed. See the weight of honey per hive roof, regardless of how much sugar is fed. That's 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 the wrong approach. Um, In short, it is better that our bees that produce some surplus any every year and 80 pounds in a good year and never need feeding than bees that produce 100 pounds in a good year and starve in poor years or need feeding all the time otherwise. You know, the seven, if we assume that it's only this every seventh year that we have a good year, we've got six lean years. And in six lean years, it's better to have sort of 30 or 40 pounds of any or 50 pounds of any per colony and have 80 pounds in a good year than to have zero, zero, zero and just 100 pounds in a good year. Um, and of course, the bees have survived in this area for 10,000 years on that principle. You've got to remember that the man's intervention is, is a failure and importing of bees is less than 200 years old in 10,000 years. So, um, right, and so the bees then. As a result of imports, the bees have been, uh, well, man hasn't done the bees any favor over the last 60 years by importing them into Cardiganshire, that's for sure. So the best bees for Cardiganshire were already, already here in the 1950s. Uh, all the exotic imports I've done over the past 60 years is to dilute the indigenous stock and make it worse. It's worse than what we had before. If we just started off with what we had and just improve it, selectively breed from what we had and improve it, we would be in a much better position today than we are now. Uh, so, so, the best bees are already here. It's just that many of the better qualities often must be the genes of alien stock. So, as I'm saying, as a result of these imports, to be successful in this harsh environment, the beekeeper must be continually breeding from the best 10% of his stocks and replacing the rubbish, or to let nature take care of the rubbish, they'll die in the winter, year on year. This is the counteract the diluting effect of these continuously imported and suited genes. It's not good, not sustainable. So as well as being skilled in the management of varroa and other bee diseases, the successful modern beekeeping in any area, I suppose, must be a skilled bee breeder and bee improver. Right, so I talked about this in my last uh, last presentation, so I'm not going to waste much time on it. But you've got a normal distribution curve can be applied to everything from the average height of a man or or, or in insurance or, or uh, radar detection or, or anything else. Put simply and apply to bee characteristics. If you have 10 hives, if you're looking for docility, you have 10 hives, 
six will be average, two will be quite evil, two will be very docile, one will be really, really evil, and one will be really, really docile. So, and you select your criteria, and that could be productivity or toughness or whatever criteria that you're breeding from, you're breeding for. So uh, I won't waste much time on it, but I covered this before, but any population, around two thirds will be average when selecting for what I select for toughness, productivity, and gentleness. So in short, breed from the best and kill the rest. Brother Adam himself said this. He was an excellent beekeeper in his time. And if you don't, the bees will soon deteriorate to the level of the average among us. Where the average bee in this area in the 1950s was good enough, the average bee today would need to be mollycoddled in summer and winter. So what we're saying then is, uh, is take a set of graphs from the, from the best colony of your 10 or from the best 10% of your 100 or whatever it is, and use the queens produced to queen the worst, and then within a couple of seasons, they will all be better than average. So uh, what's happened over the past 50 years, most of these leave alone beekeepers of the 1950s have left the craft. So today's beekeepers must either raise their own queens or collaborate with others to raise queens in order to succeed from local stock. And the bees, you know, the leave alone beekeepers of the 1950s, they could no longer survive because the bees would die or they'd get overtaken by Varroa or they'd be too nasty or they'd sting all the neighbors. So on the other hand, if we never select and raise our queens, we're committed to only ever having average bees. Right. As I said, the local average bee was acceptable 60 years ago, and the local average bee 60 years ago, if the beekeeper abandoned the hive, they would still be there in 10 years' time. Now they wouldn't. So we're not making progress, folks. So in short, bees from faraway places never do as well in an area as local stock over time. And I mean, that's not just me saying that. There's been a lot of learned people doing research, and it's been proven. It's been proven. So environmental changes, and to recap a little bit on what we talked about this, lack of forage, the local agriculture is mainly dairy, industrial scale. We've got bigger fields, synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, few hedgerows, few rye grasses without, rye grasses without clover, very few earthworms, uh, hares have disappeared, little songbirds have disappeared, we've got wall-to-wall -wall magpies, we've got rabbits everywhere. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. Agriculture altogether is not sustainable the way, the way we're going. We're killing the planet. So, there we are. A floral desert in parts of Guardianshire. All she drapes as health in England. Very little in Wales, little in South Pembrokeshire, but nothing around here. So, weather, we have global warming, more extreme weather. We got more extreme weather. It's wetter and warmer. Um, and Varroa is here to stay. You can only control it. That genie's out the bottle. Then it's not going to go back in. And these these hazards or these snags, they're not unique to Guardianship. Mike Palmer in Vermont uh, says that he's got a thousand plus colonies and exactly the same issues. And I know these people, I say these, these people are now in Normandy, in northern France. They're third generation. They, their fathers and grandfathers are kept, they are local bees. And they face exactly the same problems, both in terms of bee imports and farming practices changing. Now then, since Varroa has become more difficult to produce successfully mated, uh, mated queens. And it's quite difficult to produce mated queens in this area here anyway, because mating can be an issue. Uh, you, can, you can do a set of grafts and, and with your best endeavors, uh, they can fail to mate if you have three weeks of rain. That's a long time. Uh, Earlier seminars have covered much of this stuff, and some of it is not in books, and some of it is. Um, but this year has been a difficult one for raising queens and getting them mated. Some have mated and come into lay only to be superseded within a couple of weeks. Two have come into lay and disappeared, leaving the nukes queenless with no cells. So I don't know what's happened there. And these problems, along with the viruses and everything else, um, are problems that have appeared since Varroa was here. 
So that's why it's, I think it's important to keep uh, a mercenary eye on Baru, Baru and keep it under control. So when my father wrote his little booklet, 80% of his queens would typically become, uh, of his grafts would typically become successfully mated queens. Um, that's, that's, we can only dream about that now. Today, 30% is typical, you know, from the day you, you graft and uh, get a mated queen out of a nuke, it's, it's two out of three are, are failures. Um, so the queens fail to mate, or they turn into drone layers, or disappear, or are superseded almost as soon as they produce their first sealed brood, which is odd. Um, there's a link there to uh, Dave Cushman's website, Roger Patterson has written on it, and he's looked into this, and he's the opinion that there is scope here for much further research, and I agree with that, I can't argue with that. Um, now then, we're moving on. Uh, recapping here, uh, grafts, there's a frame of grafts there, plenty of nurse bees on there. It's important, of, it's important to have your queens raised in the ideal conditions. Um, to get the best queens, the conditions under which they are raised must be as good as we can possibly make them. Uh, and as I said, today's beekeeper has to be more skilled than those of 60 years ago to produce honey at minimum cost in terms of time, labor, and money. Unfortunately, many are not and end up importing queens and or failing to control Baroa, which is, which is sad. So raising your queens is not too difficult. The hardest bit of raising queens is to get off your backside and actually doing it. And one important thing to remember, and, and uh, my father told me this, and he was like back in about 50 years ago, you will never buy a better queen uh, for your apiary than the one that you've raised yourself from your own stock. That's a beautiful set of sealed cells there. So, summary, to sum up then, the man is slowly killing the planet to a mixture of human greed and stupidity. Um, over the past 60 years, the agricultural soil in the UK, as well as the soils of this area, have become depleted of natural renewal mechanisms such as earthworms, and is now almost totally dependent on chemicals. Recent surveys suggest that 55% of songbirds have either disappeared or become extinct to, to be replaced by wall-to-wall -wall magpies. 60 years ago, hares and rabbits were about 50-50 in this area. Now the place is inundated by rabbits, but I haven't seen a hare locally for years. All right. As beekeeping becomes more popular, the craft is often being taken over by people of limited beekeeping ability will get taken in by the hype and import more and more unsuitable stock, which is usually dead by the following spring. So, as I say, the present practice of importing unsuitable honeybee DNA in never increasing numbers year on year is unsustainable. Better results can be achieved by improving our indigenous stock and breeding from the best in our own locality year on year, right? And it's it worked for me. It worked for my family, it's worked for others. Beekeeping should be a pleasure. It should be as profitable as possible with a minimum amount of monetary and labor input and as painless as possible. So that's my summary. In this harsh area, this means raising queens from the best and getting them mated in remote apiaries over a thousand foot up where the softer yellow bees don't tend to fly. So that's, I leave that slide up there for a second. So uh, as I say, beekeeping should be a pleasure. Should be a pleasure. I uh, saw so summary there. Think about that one. And this was a slide from my last talk, but uh, it's worth putting it up there again. These bees are my own. Every queen in the year is queen that I raised. And my bees have been DNA tested in recent times. The results came back stating that they're 80% plus plus AMM. Right? So they're local stock, they're local DNA. And this year, 2020, has been a very poor one, as I said earlier in Cardiganshire. And yet, this is one of my apiaries stocked with these bees. And the picture taken on the 11th of July, they didn't gather any more. And it, 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 sort of, it was damp all the way through, but they didn't eat it either. Right? They, didn't, they didn't eat it up either. They, they, they sort of um, had a little bit more at the end of the month than they had at the beginning. 
And these hives are modified DNA types, so they've got huge brood boxes. And each super typically twice the capacity of a national. So on two of these colonies are on the fourth super. They didn't fill the fourth super, but they had full, three full supers. Um, and these, so these bees produce an average, above average crop of honey year on year. And they weren't fed a drop of syrup last year, as they had plenty of honey left in their big fat brood chambers. They're efficient in terms of honey produced per man over a labor input. I'm happy with them. And most are from my father's strains dating back, dating back to the 1960s or before. Somebody sent it from the quarantine bishops have two stocks of my father during the 1960s. So requeening those and killing all those queens and replacing them back in the 1960s would have been a mistake because there was some good DNA material there. And this is a picture of a mating apiary um, with drone colonies. And as I said, mating can be a headache. You will struggle if your neighbor has rubbish bees or if you live close to an importer of exotic bees. Uh, and this is where a group of like-minded individuals can collaborate and a suitable mating site located. And there's usually something available somewhere. But I'm lucky to have an access to this site uh, that is so harsh and even the toughest bees struggle to survive. Nevertheless, a good mating site uh, in that is unsuitable for yellow drones. And I got, I've got good meetings from there. Take my nukes up there and come back and pick them up in a month. Um, so there we are. And that's my uh, beekeeping colleague, that's Pero, and that's uh, Roger Patterson's uh, colleagues, and my old colleague, Professor Thompson. And there we are. That's all I've got to say in the matter. How are we doing for time, Roger? Um, thanks very much, Peter. Can you actually hear me, Peter? No. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, uh, apparently, um, I sounded very uh, faint earlier. I've had a bit of a fiddle around with the uh, various wires and that. Um, I'll, I'll speak up, but do I have to, Peter? No, no, I can hear you. Oh, I'll turn my, I'll turn my hearing aid up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Um, uh, I've heard some of that before, but I still find it a uh, uh, fascination. So thanks very much indeed. Um, the, uh, the questions are really pouring in. We've got two already. <laughs> uh, seriously, there's a lot more than that. Um, there are a few which are similar, so what I'll try and do is I will try and uh, uh, combine them. Um, and a few of them uh, you did actually cover later. <laughs> now, there's a couple of things I'd like to say. I know it's your uh, talk, but a couple of things I'd like to say. I'd like to... Um, uh, make it clearer that John Chambers's um, lecture that uh, that Peter mentioned is actually on the National Honey Show uh, website, um, along with a whole load of others. That's one thing. The other thing is, Peter, that the Buckfast bees of 1960s that you were talking about are very, very much different than the Buckfast bees of today. They're very much softer now than they were in, in, in that time. So, uh, okay, I will ask the uh, first question. Um, what was the attraction to move so many hives into the area? I assume the questioner means the, um, uh, the commercial beekeepers going into your area. Right, well, that's, that's, a, long, that's a good story. That's, that's 1959 was a really, really, really bumper year it was ideal from start to finish as far as the bees were concerned in this area, in Cardiff. It's, it's, it's once, it was a once in a century year. The weather was spot on. It was ideal all the way through. There was wall to wall uh, wild white clover in all the meadows and in all the pastures all over the county. And anybody who had any bees at all had a bumper season. And this was, this, I mean, this was publicized. It was well publicized. And the following year, we had um, one, if not two, of these big scale commercial beekeepers come into the area. And I thought, they thought, well, this is Bonanza now, it's going to be like this every year. But of course, it, it never was. You know, as I say, one year in seven is good. But that 1959 and maybe 1960 were, were particularly good years. 
And of course, it was after that, it was it's a very poor year. 1963 was, was a year with a harsh winter and, and lots of bees died uh, everywhere. And as I say, they had the wrong bees. Um, they had bees that would have done very well in 1959 or maybe in 1960. But overall, over the next 10 years, they, they, they were a, a failure. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, we, we've spoken about this recently, but I was a member of the Bee Farmers Association for about 10 years in the 1970s. And um, I knew some of these people that moved into your area, and they did it because the uh, ground was cheap, the houses were cheap, and uh, they could set up uh, a, a bee farm a lot cheaper than they could in England. It wasn't until they got there that they realized how harsh the conditions were. Oh, yes, that's, that's definitely true. I mean, the, the 1970s, um, um, uh, dairy farming was taking off and, and the herds were getting bigger uh, and, and milking piles and things like this were replacing milking machines. So the herds were getting bigger and a small holdings, as I said, this, this, the, where, the, where a small farm had been swallowed up by a bigger farm, the farm buildings became derelict and the house became derelict in many places. So they could be bought for next to nothing. I mean, with the, where my father had a quarantine um, apiary, it, it, was, it was almost falling down, but I, it's, I think it's been converted to holiday cottages or something. That would, it, it, it's, um, the, it became a fashionable thing to sell that for big money to rich people and, and, a, and, and a bit of a rubbish field with it because it's somewhere for the pony to be kept. Um, you know, but the properties, as you say, in the 1970s, property prices were, you could buy a reasonable house for 5,000 pounds, let alone, you know, let alone a, 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 an abandoned uh, farmhouse. Abandoned farmhouse, you'd almost have one to fit. Um, the next one's an interesting one. What happens to the temperament of bees in generations after F2? That is F3, F4, etc. Well, I don't know. They, be, they, be, they become mongrelized. But if you breed, I tend to breed for um, color. I look at them and say, if they like smarties, I don't breed from them because the queens are going to be all like smarties. But if they're, if they're, if they're predominantly dark and there's very few yellow stripes, they, they, I, I breed from them. And the darker they are, the gentler they become. So. You know, I suppose if you could do a DNA analysis, they they more back to more pure AMM. But um, uh, I, I, my rule of thumb is, you know, they're, they're uh, the, if they nice and uniformly dark, and they got everything else is good about them, then I breed from them. Right. Well, I'm no expert on this, but I've I've done it several times. I think you can actually get through that, because if you raise queens from the aggressive ones. In general, those after that aren't um, anywhere near, near as bad. They're still probably not very docile, but they're still quite um, uh, still quite touchy, but they're a lot better. Um, right, what sort of techniques did uh, did you or do you use with aggressive bees? Well, it depends what you want to do. Uh, it, 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 dep it depends. You, you've got to... It, it's intangible skin skills again. You've got to know how to use the smoker, and you've got to realize that bees, they don't want to sting you, right? They, they've got about five steps, or they've got about five levels of temperament before they, they come and, and attack you. And the, fir the, first, the first thing, they raise their hackles a bit and come to the door and have a look, see who's there, right? Well, if you've gone up, and put your foot on the stand and rock the beer. If they're already come out, don't they? you know, uh, it's it's you've got to keep their level of of uh, keep their mood in level zero or level one or level two. And you're right, but level two or level three, I would call it when they start to fly at you and bounce off your face. Uh, and but you know they only sting you when they're level four and level five. It's it's it's, it's keeping it's keeping the aggression down. And another thing you got to remember is. If you've got an apiary of half a dozen colonies and one of them you know is, is, is a little bit defensive, right? And you've got work to do on all of them, do the others first and do the, do the aggressive one last. Because if you do the aggressive one first, they'll all be aggressive because they wind each other up. It's little things like that. And, and I don't think those things are in books. I don't know why I haven't seen them anywhere. But it's things that you learn with experience gained over years. 
and the, the, you know, intangible skills and, and the instant to give the smoke. That's, that's something you can't learn from a book. That and you can tell by the, the noise the bees make. The buzz, the, if you go to the angry buzz and the calm buzz, it, it's, that's not written in any books that I've seen. I don't know. What do you think? Okay. Um, yeah, that leads us neatly into the next question. Peter talked about beekeepers not being taught good handling skills. What are Peter's uh, top three tips for handling bees to avoid stings? Don't wind them up. One. <laughs> don't, don't don't wind them up. And 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 number two and number three, don't wind them up. You know, it's and don't jerk things about. It, things that wind. What's going to wind the bees up? You know, the, the bees' natural enemies in nature is the bear, and the, the bear comes and he stamps all the ground as he's coming along. Right? Don't wear dark clothes. The bees. Go, the, the bear has got all black, right? And the only delicate piece of the bear is going to be his eyes. So the bee knows it is not going to attack. He's not going to attack your body. He's not going to attack the bear's fur. It's, it's pointless because he's going to go straight for the eyes. And um, that's why you wear a, wear a veil. Don't wear dark glasses because they've got to go for your glasses. Right? Um, but little th little, it's a little thing. Don't wind the bees up. And good experience, the old-fashioned beekeepers with a the, with the, with the dust coat suit and, the, and Queen Victoria's veil, they'd go along there, pop, 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 nice and calm and quiet. And they would get to whatever needed to be doing done very often before the bees realize they're in there. You know? Um, it's, it's, I, I think the sheriff suit and the Wellingtons and the gloves and the big, huge smoker, it, it teaches bad beekeeping. It, it, it allows people to get away without getting stung and they don't realize that they've wound the bees up very often. You know, I, I, I've gone along with people and they are all suited and booted and I've only got a veil and I'm getting stung and they don't realize that I'm getting stung because they're clumsy. You know, so anyway, so that's, so that's, that's my a, rant that's over. That's on its own, isn't it? Uh, how many colonies do you think are needed to make a selection to improve, improve your stock? Two. Two. Simple as that. Well, one is going to be better than the other, isn't it? Yeah, that, that, that's the minimum, though. <laughs> right, if, you, if you've got half a dozen, or if you've got half a dozen and your friends got half a dozen, you've got 12. Right, two of those 12 will be good for whatever property that you want. Or the association. You know, if, if, if you belong to the association, if you've only got two colonies and, and everybody else in the association is 10 in the association, and you've got two colonies each, you've got, a, you've got 20 colonies, haven't you? You've got enough to select. Right. What uh, criteria would you use for selecting a mating apiary? One that's, one that's not next door to an exotic beekeeper. Right. Right. And how would you know if you were? Well, that's the problem. That's the problem. It, if you if you find one that's in a harsh area, um, a thousand foot up, thousand foot up is good because the yellow drones don't tend to fly up a thousand foot up, and that's very rarely. Um, it's difficult because I thought I had a good meeting appear here until five years ago, and all of a sudden everything turned yellow. But then it was only then that I found out that somebody moved in down the road. It's it's tricky. It's tricky. You need, need local knowledge and you need to keep your eyes about you. What you could do, Peter, is go for a walk and have a look and see what bees are on the flowers. Yes, exactly. You could do that. Uh, here's another one that's on a similar line. Regarding remote mating apiaries, how far will drones and queens fly in order to mate? Here in Mid Wales, I'm possibly the last local beekeeper, 400 foot, before the valley rises to nearly 800 foot. But it's very remote up there, with no beekeepers nearby. I have no idea how, f how far they fly. They tell you in the books that they fly up to three miles or three kilometers or, or something. Um, but I'm sure that there are conditions our dark bees will meet a lot closer than that. Um, because I've had successful meetings when the weather's been quite 
anti, you know? When it when certainly when you haven't had weather fine enough and calm enough to have sort of drone congregation areas or stuff like this that they talk about on in books. Um I d I don't know is a short answer. Um do you use a donor hive to help with colonies that may be light on bees? First four months beekeeping here. From what I can gather, so I assume the person has come from um, from abroad, but I don't know. From what I can gather, the secret to a honey crop is a hive full of bees. In order to achieve this, you need good queens. Would you agree? It seems to me as if it's somebody come from abroad, perhaps, and they've heard the usual story that you, you've got to have prolific uh, queens filling the hive up with bees. It's more important to have a balanced hive. You know, it, it, what what are those bees you got in the hive? The, the, the hive has got to be in harmony. Right? It's got to be natural. I'm against this business of of, of, of willy nilly sort of equalizing your bees up by moving frames of brood about. It's it's it's, it's possible that you move in disease about. It. It's, it's possible that you cut in burrow about the place. Um, I like to leave them alone in as much uh as because if it's a mature colony and there's not enough bees the queen is no good you know um or or if it's good brood pattern or leave them alone leave leave interfering too much with the bees is a quite a common mistake yeah it's you don't grow prized potatoes if you dig them up every week to count the roots right and it's the same it's the same with bees you can you can you can learn a lot when examining a bee by looking outside before you even take the top off. But I see very few people doing that. They carry pollen in, do they look right, you know? And and then you you take the crown board off or you take the supers off and you look down. You can look down between the frames. You don't even have to pull the frames out and you get an idea. It, it's, you know, um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Right. Um, it, um, I'm going further down the list, and it seems that I'm still very quiet. Um, is that make any difference? Make any difference? It, it's it's good. You wall to wall, yeah. You 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 uh, you're coming through loud and clear. Can you hear me, okay, Peter? Yes, yes. No. Right. Um, well, obviously, um, Carl, there seems to be something wrong with the system. I would think, because um, if Peter can hear me, I've got loads and loads here saying that I'm quiet. So, uh, Peter, um, sorry, Carl, can you take over, please? Yep, no problem at all. I ho hopefully you can all hear me. Um, I'll just take it from where Roger left off. There's, there's a whole series of questions. Uh, sorry about the uh, technical difficulties. Um, Peter, to get new starters on board, um, beekeeper training needs to be standardised some way um, how can these habits be nipped in the bud? Is this possible? What, what I don't understand the question. How can which okay. habits? Well, I, I guess, and I am only guessing, habits are to buy docile bees and prolific bees and not necessarily sustainable bees. So the, the sort of emphasis early days is is to get people going on on something that's easy to handle lovely and docile but you have to feed them loads of honey to keep them going over winter how can this be nipped in the bud is it is this possible it's i i don't know if, if it's possible I, it's one suggestion if you want to learn beekeeping don't don't buy the books and look at the youtube and then go and spend your money if you can hang on to the coattails of somebody who's got years of experience, go give them a hand out. Give them a hand out. Offer, your, offer your services to somebody who successfully keeps bees in your area and has got to, they've got to be, right, help them out because there's plenty of times that a beekeeper could do with labor. I mean, I had a young lad, schoolboy, he was 16 years old and he helped me for three or four years and he's gone off now to do he's got, he's got his own bees and he came and he helped me for three summers and i gave him schoolboy's wages and he helped me 
and he, he picked it up very quickly and he became very good. He became, became very good at spotting queens, he better than me spotting queens, young, nice young guys, and very good at handling bees. He could handle quite a, a, a you know, after a couple of years, he, he came good. And that, that experience that he's got, he's got, um, I gave him a couple of colonies and he's overwintered them and he's got honey off of them. And, you know, it, it's, that, that's the way to do it. Rather than, rather than look at YouTubes and, and a lot of these YouTubes are about American bees. It's an American climate, it's much drier than ours. Uh, and it's a totally different ball game. And things that might work for them won't work here. But if you hang on, if you can find somebody in your area who successfully keeps bees and he's kept bees for some time, go and offer them a hand. Okay. I'm, sure that, I'm sure they'll accept it. Okay. Um, and here's a cha challenging question. Um, you do not advocate modern practices of pesticides on crops, yet you seem to advocate chemicals on treating Baroa. No, I don't. Okay. No, I don't. Well, I didn't, that, that's I didn't, I didn't, what, I, what, I, what I said was you got to monitor the Baroa. you got to keep an eye on it, keep a mercenary eye on it. I didn't say put hard chemicals on it. There are oxalic acid treatments and there are formic acid treatments okay. that, that are environmentally friendly. And, and up until 2015, I hadn't treated at all for five years and the Varroa count was very low. Okay, thank you. Um, here, here's a good one, I say. We, were, we started beekeeping five years ago and at the time we were advised to keep Italian and Buckfast bees. Um, we found them, as you described, soft and not capable of managing without significant feeding. How would you proceed to improve the stock? Well, they tell me that a large fraction of the DNA of typical local bees are still about 50% AMM. Um, I would not import any more bees and breed from the best of what he's got. And keep doing that for a few years, keep doing that for two or three years, and you'd be surprised how, how they'll change, how they'll get dark. And, and stop it, stop bringing more exotics into the area, and nature will take care of the rest. Okay, brilliant. And this, this is a dream question, okay? I have access to 2,500 acres of natural forest with 26 identified wild surviving colonies. Just managed to move all commercial bees away to at least three kilometers. Um, so pleased that people can take up this ideology. What would you do next? I don't know. Can, can you repeat? Can you can you repeat that again? Okay. Somebody's got two and a half thousand acres of natural forest. They've got about twenty six identified wild colonies, uh, and they've managed to move all the commercial bees away. What would you do next? Leave them alone and see what happens. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, no idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well. Let, let, let's pick the other end of the spectrum then. I'm a first year beekeeper and in spring the only available bees are ones from abroad. Um, what's, where, where's the local supply of bees that I can't have because I'd like to have British bees but there's, there's nobody advertising them. No, I don't suppose there is. Um, why do you want to start so early in the summer? I can't answer that one. Right. Uh, so that per that person needs that person needs to not get off and have his own bees straight away. That person that summer, next let's let's suppose it's next summer. It's 2021 now. Yeah, 2021. Find a local beekeeper who does well in his area, right, and latch on to him latch on to them and give him a hand for a season, which is what that lad did to me. Right? He latched on to me for, for a season and then the next season he latched on to me and then 
at the end of the second season, I gave him a colony. And the season after, I gave him another colony. So he's got two colonies now. And I think he's built up, and he's probably got four or five. Okay. You know? yeah. That's the way to do it. Not, not read a book and go to a catalog and buy something. If you give somebody a hand, sometimes they'll give you some bees. Okay. There's a few people saying that Roger's quiet. And I must admit, just enjoy the bliss of Roger being quiet because it's, it's, it's quite a godsend, actually. <laughs> yeah. um, can, but, can, can you hear me now, Carl? No. No, <laughs> I can't hear you at all. Yeah. Um, but there, there are two questions I could try to try to combine here, uh, Peter. Do you have any simple smoker tips and what fuel do you put in your smoker? Well, I, I use corrugated cardboard. I try and I know that in, and I use corrugated cardboard for all my life, but the cardboard, I realize that the cardboard you get now is much more tarry than it used to be. It comes from China probably, but is much, and it's not as nice as the cardboard, but in the old days, sacking, but you can't get sacking anymore. But I still use corrugated cardboard, I admit. Uh, and the, the technique is, the technique is, uh, don't over smoke the bees, right? Don't, don't, don't over smoke. But make the bees aware that the smoke is there. So when you see a row of bees, they're all poking their heads up between the frames and looking at you, give them a little puff over their heads. And so they turn tail and go back down in between the frames. And, and there's this, a split second in timing, and you can't be taught it, you can only learn it, and you can only learn it by being stung. There's a split second, you can give a puff of smoke and everything's back under control, and if you miss that split second, it's too late, and whatever you do, you've lost it. Mm. Right. And it's hard, it's hard to describe, but it's hard to put into words. You could, it's, it's, you've got to experience it. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, another good question, I thought. Should I make special provision to make for raising drones in my hives? Well, I don't bother. I don't bother. But in a meeting apiary, it used to be thought that if you had two drone colonies in a meeting apiary, that was enough. But I don't think that's the case. I tend to. I've got about half a dozen good stocks of drones, good good drone uh, genetic stocks then in my meeting apiary and I find that I find that's better than just having one or two. Is Roger waving his hand? <laughs> no, he, he's he's there. The screen. We can't hear him anymore. It's wonderful. Can you, it's brilliant. Can, yeah. can you can you can you hear me at all? No, no, no. We can't hear any we just see a lips move. Yeah. <laughs> can you, can no, we can't hear a thing, Roger, sorry. Um right. What's the longest time you would leave between inspections during swarm season with your local bees? I, this year, with the weather we've had this year, I left them three weeks. Right, I've left them three weeks. Um, the critical time for me is the first two weeks in June, is the June gap. Right, and I tend to, I, well, it, it's, it's, you know, a fortnight. I'll inspect them. If I haven't inspected them in a fortnight, I'll go and have a quick look. But I don't go through every frame on every hive. I don't pull all the frames out of every hive. Sometimes I don't pull any frames out. You know, you take the supers off and have a look down. And if I do pull frames, I don't often pull more than about four. If I see eggs and lava and everything looks balanced, there's enough room, and put it all back together. Give them another super if they need it. You know. I was talking to Randy Oliver in the Isle of Man, and I asked him 1,500 hives or whatever he's got. I said, how long did it take you to do an inspection? Well, he says, his average 10 seconds per colony. <laughs> but there's three of them at it. One is taking the roof off, one is smoking, and the other one's taking a peep in and shutting the pack again. Okay. Um, I haven't got it down to that yet, mate. Not yet, no. But, okay, well, what about this one? Um, you don't need to answer this one, Peter, but Jules has asked a really intriguing question, which I, I don't want you to answer, Peter, but it's, have you noticed a colony on brood and a half being more aggressive with wasps when the super is under the brood box rather than above? Now, don't answer that one. 
I, I, I can I can I can answer that one. I haven't got anything on a brood and a half, and I would never have anything on a brood and a half, and I would never have anything on a double brood, because having a queen in more than one box isn't twice the work; it's four times the work. Right? If if you've got to use a brood and a half, your box is too small. Okay. Buy a bigger box. Okay. Which is Another why I got question. which is which is why I got bees in 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 Langstroth and Dedans. Yeah, yeah. This was yeah. I mean, it was asking all of that between with respect to wasps. That's a tough one to answer. Um, here's a, a, a question for someone in deepest darkest Wales. Um, do you think today's beekeeping, the urban beekeeping? Is more successful than rural beekeeping. I don't even know what urban beekeeping means. Okay. Uh, what is it? What is urban? Is that urban a big village? Uh, urban is when there's more than two houses within <laughs> spitting distance. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. It, I know what it's easy. You. Uh, I've no idea. I've no idea. It depends. I suppose if you're somewhere like Cardiff, which is a group of small villages clustered together. Right, and there's a lot of green in between all these villages, a lot of parks and things like that. I suppose urban beekeeping could be quite profitable because there's a lot of cultivated flowers and gardens there. But I, I don't know. I can't really answer that. Um, okay. Yeah, Carl, Carl, can I nip in? I think going back to the last question about the brood and a half, um, I think I'm reading into it that the person is doing this, this modern trick of putting a super of honey actually underneath the brood box yeah, and I'm wondering if the the wasps um, uh, are actually going for it because the bees can't defend it. I I suspect that's what this is about. Any comments, Peter? No, no. The the wasps are a pest. That's for sure. That's for sure. I, I catch. Um, I, I catch, I, I make traps out of old uh, pop bottles, cut the top off and turn it upside down so it's like a cone on top and I put a bit of syrup in the bottom and leave them littered around the, the apiary. And I can get quite often, well, earlier than now, but you can get half a pint of, of wasps in about a day and a half. You know, you, you have to tip these out and, and, and replenish them because they're full of wasps, and wasps are a pest. And I've had the wasps rob a really good, strong colony out completely before now, in a bad season. Yeah. Wasps, are a, wasps can be a menace. Yeah, I've just heard something really interesting just recently, which I've never heard of before, is if you put an empty super underneath your brood box towards the end of the year, it gives them loads of room to cluster underneath. And it helps sort of defend against the wasps and things, but it, it it keeps them all together and clustered in a way that keeps them warm. And I've never heard that before. I'm really quite excited to give that a go. Now, another good question here: um, Do you ever use foundationless frames at all? No, I have tried plastic frames because I um, I bought some plastic frames cheap and I waxed them myself. And I did an experiment. I put I alternated uh, wooden frames with wax foundation and the plastic frames with foundation that I'd waxed with, with, you know, the plastic foundation that I'd waxed myself. And the bees will draw out the wooden frames uh, with, the, with the wax foundation, the wired wax foundation, and they'll ignore the plastic until they've drawn all the, all the wax out. And then they move on to the plastic and they make a mess of it. So I, I, don't, I don't use them anymore. Okay. Probably, uh, if you're, probably if you're in a strong flow area or in a hot area like America and, and, and you've got really, you know, where, where Italian type bees, where it's the area suited, probably you would draw a plastic foundation really well, I don't know. Okay, fair enough. Um, there's loads of questions and comments leading to the sort of smoking that you do. Um, I'll, I'll just try to pick on one of them. Um, does over-smoking lead to more aggression? Well, you demoralize. The more you smoke them, 
if if it comes to adversarial beekeeping and you've got your suit and your Wellingtons and your welding gloves and all the rest of it, and you, 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 you bee proof, you sting proof, and you smoke them too much, you're going to demoralize the bees. The secret is not to fight, you know, is to get what you need to do without uh, without raising their temper up to level five, you know, keep it level two or three and, and have the odd sting and keep a little bit of control. But if it's got to become that adversarial, then I would put the supers on the stand and take the bee blue chamber away to somewhere else to to work on it and let the, let the defensive bees all hang about the supers and put it back together afterwards. You know, that's it's because you it demoralize the bees. It, it, it's, you're not going to get any honey if you demoralize the bees all the time. Yep. Okay. And if you don't mind, the final question for tonight. Um, you, you talked about um, keeping mites down and things. How do you keep the mite numbers down without doing the normal sort of chemical interventions? The, the hard chemicals, I, it's, it's a pyramid, isn't it? You know, you, you can, you can, the bees are not so susceptible to varroa as they were sort of when the varroa first came 25 years ago. Right, so that's number one. Right? So the bees, the bees have built up a certain amount of resistance. And you breed from the bees uh, that, that have a certain amount of resistance. And as I said, up to 2015, I hadn't treated at all for five years. And varroa counts with, you know, there was a lot of varroa here and there, but it, it wasn't, that it didn't need treating. And then oxalic acid is a natural product. Formic acid is a natural product. And I don't use hard chemicals. I don't, okay. I don't use that, that abandonment swarm that I got at Barua everywhere. I gave that to, um, what you call it, uh, scripts, uh, this, um, hard chemical scripts and it didn't survive. It didn't survive. Okay. So congratulations, Peter. Uh, it's been a wonderful talk. Um, there's one thing I need just to say from everybody that's participating. If, you can let me know how to make Roger Patterson quiet. Please let me know. My name is carlcollier at gmail.com. Uh, I would love to hear a solution <laughs> to that one, please. Yeah, Robert, Roger, you're whispering in the background. Uh, Peter, that was a brilliant talk. Um, there's a lot in there. I, I so wish I could just capture something from five decades of beekeeping uh, and with your father as well and all that stuff going on and here's the father's book clip you can see so it, it's one of my best read items uh, and just to make clear he's got more hair than Peter <laughs> okay yeah but yeah but um, thank you so much for everyone tonight for, for hanging on in there uh, Peter He's a run through rare speaker, but he's got a lot to listen to. And I hope you enjoyed the NatBit talks. There's more to follow. Please keep in touch. And thank you so much. Well, okay then. Yeah. yeah before, before we go off, I was fortunate in my generation that I had a lot of older mentors to sort of follow around. Uh, we didn't have YouTube, we didn't have computers, but uh, there was plenty of opportunity for experience uh, to follow these older people about. Uh, and and learn from their techniques, right? And learn from their techniques. I mean, um, one technique, for example, before we go, one one technique: removing the supers, helping an old chap put his super clearers in, and go pick the supers up the next day, right? And super clearers go in and smoke it, put the entrance blocks in, and put the super clearers in. Go back tomorrow, give me a hand tomorrow night to get the supers in. The first thing he did, he went around all the colonies and stuffed grass in all the entrances so bees couldn't come out. So then. You could carry the supers and put them in his van without even putting a veil on because there are no bees flying anywhere. Right? And then the last thing you go around and pull all the grass out the entrances and run. So, you know, that's not in any book, but it's good practical experience, you know. But it, it's you learn, you learn, and that the people that are big questions that we had tonight about people, you know, they want to learn uh, where to get this and that and the other find out there's got to be somebody in your area that's experienced beekeeper just cultivate the friendship with them and offer them free assistance and i'm sure they'll take you up take you up on it and and learn from them 
Okay. Okay, then thanks very much. Yep, thank you very yes. much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.